W-O-V-U-L-P, Cleveland. This is Open Door with Vince Robinson. In-depth conversations with people who are making a difference in the lives of others here and around the world. Culture is at the heart of who you are. Know your culture, find yourself on Open Door with Vince Robinson. Great dawning, grand rising Cleveland, Ohio. Welcome to another edition of Open Door with Vince Robinson. I am privileged to have a guest with me today who is no stranger to Cleveland, but she's (laughs) actually living in a small town in the Orlando area called Bellevue, Florida. She is an alumna of Caramu and she's got a theatrical background. She's also known to some as Mother Rapper. She's got quite a list of accolades that can be heaped upon her. But right now, I'm just going to welcome her to Open Door. Her name is Renee Matthews Jackson. Welcome to Open Door, Renee. Thanks, Vince. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm honored to be on your show. We go way, way back. and um, We'll talk about some other Robinsons that used to have us at their venues. And it's a pleasure to be here. All right. So uh, why don't we just talk about what you're doing now? You've been away from Cleveland how long? Well, I've been away. Actually, April 24th will be six years. I graduated from college in 2015, the second oldest graduate in my class um, from Cleveland State, and I moved here the next year. And so I've been here six years. Okay. And and how are you finding it down there? I love Florida. I love Tallahassee more than anywhere. And I believe it's because it's the state capital and it's like a real serious um, country melting pot. I, I, I was teaching daycare and my kids look like the United Nations, and I love that. And um, so I've been active. I got here, and, and I was here in April, and in June, I got a role at one of the biggest theaters here, uh, Theater Tallahassee. And since I have moved to uh, Bellevue, and my my activities in Bellevue because of COVID have been very limited, but it kind of made me put together manuscripts and, and, and put my poetry out there even more and finish some plays. So, uh, I've been active. I'm not going to ever stop being active. My son asked me, um, my stop writing poems and go ahead and publish those books. But I've, uh, finished three manuscripts, but I'm still writing poems every day. Okay. So um, why don't we talk about your life in Cleveland? Because you accomplished quite a bit while you were here. Uh, Talk about growing up in Cleveland. I I give guests a chance to talk about where they grew up and how they grew up just to provide some context. And congratulations to you for your relocation, by the way. You know, I I don't want to say that I'm envious, but, you know, my time in Florida was usually relegated to like one or two or three week vacations. And then I had to come back up here. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm the proverbial snowbird. But, you know, the, the real snowbirds will stay down there for like four or five mm-hmm. months. So, you know, I'm like a, a, a snow chicklet or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you a funny thing. I just went back to Cleveland um, for my eldest brother's 75th birthday, not Dr. Matthews. I don't want to, you know, he's going to like 75. Don't tell people I'm 75 because he's just a year older than me, Dr. Matthews. But I went back to Cleveland for my eldest brother's birthday and it hadn't snowed in about a week. And the day I got there, it started snowing. So my family was like, why did you bring the snow? I said, well, I can't bring snow from Florida, but it snowed the whole four days I was there. So that's the part of Cleveland I do not miss. I'm not a cold weather person. Uh, My husband used to take my children tobogganing and what have you. I never went. They used to build their little igloos outside in the backyard in the snow. I never helped. So the warm weather, weather is much better for me, especially I have arthritis and I have asthma. And so it's been treating me pretty good here. Uh, But Cleveland, I'm from the east side, the north side, the west side. I worked at uh, 
all of the uh, estates, you know, the, the, I don't know what you call them. We call them the projects. I'm just going to be honest. And with the Boys and Girls Club for years, um, I'm a alumni of Caramel. I was on staff there with the youth department for nine years. Um, Caramel um, was my stomping ground. Cleveland is my hometown, and I will always represent Cleveland. Um, I remember we used to go down to the museum. We called it the Duck Pond. Uh, and people were like, the Duck Pond? What's the Duck Pond? Because it was a every Sunday thing for us. It wasn't a big deal to go to the museum. It's something our parents took us to. And um, when I grew up and I found out it was a real museum, but I mean, I had been inside, but I didn't think of it that way. It was family day on Sundays. I was amazed that we called this historic place a Duck Pond. And I understand there's some big changes there now that downtown is not like it used to be. I haven't yeah. been downtown in downtown Cleveland about six years. Yeah, there there's been a dramatic uh, transformation of downtown, and it and it came when they kind of redid Euclid Avenue because they created special bus lanes, and so RTA had a lot to do with that. But with that redesign came a, a kind of a different feel to Cleveland. Uh, but as you look at the city right now, you're seeing the evidence of a great deal of gentrification. Yes. Uh, you, you're seeing an influx of um, residential property in downtown Cleveland. That's part of this gentrification uh, movement right now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, things are changing. Uh, the population has been dwindling in, in uh, Cleveland. There was a time when Cleveland was, you know, the 10th largest market in the country. Yes. And there were more folks in the Cleveland area than there were in Columbus. But now Columbus, I believe, is is uh, Ohio's largest city. So, wow. yeah, there are changes. Um, there is a lot of development that's taking place. Some of it is positive. Some of it is not so positive. So we just kind of deal with it. Uh, but I'm just hopeful that somehow we'll be able to retain some of our footprint in the city and not be run out of town by those who are mm-hmm. speculating on properties and, and all the other things that are going on. Yes, I was um, born on 85th and Woodland and my childhood was spent a lot on Cedar. Uh, when Cleveland Clinic only had the little white building, my mom worked there in hypertension. And then I watched this this development of Cleveland Clinic. Now, I can't be too harsh on them because in my family, I had a lot of people who were employed by Cleveland Clinic. And as a matter of fact, I think if you look at the statistics, Cleveland Clinic hires more African-Americans than anybody else in the city. And But what it did was part of our history was dismantled like Red Walters and, and, and the doctors, the black doctors who had uh, their businesses along Cedar Avenue. And and um, a lot of people don't know what's his name that is the fight promoter, Don King, of our community. Um, and sometimes I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, because even here in Florida, in Frenchtown, uh, Frenchtown, Tallahassee is the oldest African-American community in the whole state of Florida. And I know this because I was talking with the mayor here, Mayor Daly, and I was saying it's one of the first in the state of Florida. He said, no, ma'am, I'm here to correct you. It is the first black community in the state of Florida. And so at one point they start putting up these placards with the history of Frenchtown. And I said, okay, what's going on? You know, I see these buildings going up all around, um, you know, all around. And so what's going on? What I realized was uh, gentrification was happening right before my eyes, just like it did me as a child growing up in Cedar. And so on Cedar. And so I created the Frenchtown Coalition for the Arts. And what it was, was I started with three people and my friend Summer said, give it a name. And he he and Nola, Nola was born, of course, in New Orleans. And and so that's why her name is Nola. And so we decided that night we'd call it the Frenchtown Coalition for the Arts. We grew to 28 people 
Well, what happened is politics got in the game and everybody kind of backed off a little and we fizzled out. But Princeton Coalition for the Arts still exists. And if I make my way back to Tallahassee, which I have the druthers to do, maybe next year, once COVID comes down, a lot of things are going to change for me. Um, then I'm going to reboot Frenchtown Coalition for the Arts because we were being interviewed by the press. People were joining by the droves and then politics gets in the way. And I'm not at liberty to speak on the politics because it was actually going to be something that was presented in court. But then, of course, COVID happened again. So we'll see how it goes. But yeah. I am not against gentrification per se, but when you say affordable housing in a predominantly black community exists and the people who live in that community can't afford the housing, there's something wrong with that picture for me. Yeah, the real issue is the fact that people are being displaced and, yes. uh, you know, they're being pushed to different places. And sometimes it's either pushed to a different residence or pushed into a penal institution. Yes, that's the problem. You yes. know, and, and there have to be things that we can do to offset that, you know. So that's one of the reasons that it's important for us to be politically active. Uh, that's one of the reasons that it's important for us to have development corporations that have the interests of the residents at heart. Mm -hmm. Because not all development corporations are created equal. And we're seeing the evidence of that in Cleveland. Uh, the radio station that we're on right now is owned by Burton Bell Car Development Inc. And I have to give credit to Burton Bell Car because they are doing things to preserve and to uh, you know maintain the integrity of the community that they serve. Yeah. Uh, there is something called the Opportunity Corridor. I don't know if you had a chance. I've to, heard uh, about it. I heard well, my let me, daughter. I think my youngest daughter got on the. Uh, high, she's afraid of the highway. Something dramatic happened as a teenager, and she was afraid of the highway. But she somehow got onto the little uh, ramp where the Opportunity Corridor is. And she, we have a, a family chat, and she texts and she says, I'm on this highway and I don't know how to get off. And my husband was like, where? And she said, uh, Opportunity Corridor. And that was the first time I heard of it. Now, I had heard plans about it because my brother sits on the board. Yes. Uh, we're going to so, dive into that a little bit deeper because I have some information to share with you about that. And it okay. relates to the Cleveland Clinic. So we're going to talk about that when we come back. Yes. Uh, you're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. My guest this morning is... Renee Matthews Jackson. She is a multidisciplinary artist, and we're going to talk about her art before this program ends. Trust me on that. We'll be right <laughs> back after this. Why you want this to WOVU 95.9 FM? Here's the reason why. We play all independent music from Cleveland artists. Yes, we do each and every night. We support the community. We support the Cleveland local artists. This is what we do. And we got the hottest playlist from gospel, from R&B, from rap, the hip hop, and also we have jazz right here at WOVU 95.9 FM. Don't forget to download our app right now. Now, WOVU, this is the Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is Renee Matthews Jackson, multidisciplinary artist. We've been talking about the Opportunity Corridor, and what I wanted to share with you about that is that there are some who are saying that the Opportunity Corridor was created for the benefit of Cleveland Clinic, and it has shortened the commute for, for many people who come from the south of Cleveland and from other parts. They don't have to make that traverse all the way up I-90 to Dead Man's Curve to yes. Martin Luther King and all of that. They can come in from the other side. It has, it has I don't want to say disfigured the neighborhood, but has it has definitely changed the nature of the neighborhood. Some of it is good. Some of it is not so good. I, I spoke to the owner of a gas station. I think it's probably somewhere around uh, 89th or 79th in, in uh, Buckeye or Woodland. One of those two streets. It's a Sunoco mm -hmm. station. It's one of the few black owned stations 
in Cleveland and they've gotten the benefit of that traffic. And I said, well, you know, are white folks stopping at the station? And she said, yeah. So I guess okay. they're doing well enough that they can do some improvements like repaving the lot and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. But you have also seen some displacement. People had their homes purchased and they moved out so that they could build that freeway. So, yes, Cleveland Clinic is is getting the benefit from it. Uh, Burton Bell Car is also in the process of developing certain parts of that area. So it's not all bad. But, yeah. you know, it did not provide what they told us on the front end. They made it seem like, oh, you know, this is going to create so much opportunity. But who is it creating opportunity for? Mm-hmm. That is the real question. And right now. Is Caramel House benefiting, benefiting from it? I can't say. Um, I know that it is adjacent to that area. Uh, how they would benefit, I don't know. But I think that Caramu is probably connected somehow with the Fairfax development. Entity. It is. So with with that, you know, I'm sure that they are considering Caramu in development that they're doing in that area. Mm-hmm. I also how about know- the juvenile detention center? How does that fit in? Well, that's another rabbit hole right there. Uh, <laughs> I always and, go into those rabbit yeah, holes. Yeah, <laughs> and and what I'm hearing is that they're looking at, and I could be completely wrong about this, so don't quote me, but they're mm-hmm. talking about uh, creating another facility. So it, it's something oh, wow. that I heard somewhere again, but I can't confirm or deny the truth of that. But You um, know, originally, uh, Margaret Ford Taylor wanted that uh, area to create Caramel Village. And of course, as politics would have it, uh, that was the very year, because it was just in the planning stages, that was the very year that um, they decided to oust Margaret for whatever reasons. Uh, We still don't know to this day what that was about. But she had a wonderful plan for Caramel Village over there with, educational resources for young people to develop their art. I mean, it was just, and that was in, oh my, that was in 1996. So this has been in the planning stages for many years. It's not a new thing, you know? Yeah. Well, I will say this, uh, under the current leadership that they have at Caramu, uh, they've done some expansion I mean, if you haven't been to Caramu lately, if you walked in, you wouldn't recognize it because they've oh, done I'm, I'm so very proud. I'm very yeah. aware. I mean, people keep me in the loop because of how long I was involved there. But I think Tony Sias is doing a fantastic job. He played my husband in Raising in the Sun. And sometimes I call him and say, husband, I'm very proud of you. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a stage husband. Um And Tony and I have done lots of things together. As a matter of fact, when he became um, a CEO, he said he asked me some things about running the youth department because I was with Caramel's youth department for nine years. And um, I shared my information with him. I wasn't looking for a job because I was still in college. And so um, but I'm very, very, very proud of Tony and what he's doing and his staff with Caramel House. It is moving in the right direction. And for many years, we worked under strain. I mean, the Playhouse would get $3.5 million for their season, and we would get $350,000. But we still did excellent shows. I mean, the caliber of our shows were always outstanding. And so uh, the shame of it is that we've always been made to work on a shoestring budget, and we made it work. But I think we have to do something to fight against that now because the Playhouse was right around the block and uh, they got more money to do a Black history production than we got the whole year. So that has changed. I see that has changed. And I'm very proud of Tony for insisting on that change. Well, you know, it's ironic, too, that the Cleveland Playhouse relocated. So they're, they're repurposing, yeah, they're repurposing that, that, uh, and I'm, you know, again, Cleveland Clinic owns that building. That's what I was going to say. Cleveland Clinic probably (laughs) took over that too. And they're going to do whatever they're going to do with it. 
Uh, my, son go and back. I, my son is a phlebotomist mm -hmm. and he's worked at Cleveland Clinic many, many years. And we had a discussion about that. And I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want any controversy to surround him. But he said, Ma, they're going to turn that into a parking lot. I said, we're not going to let them turn that place into a parking lot. He said, Ma, it was Sears. And it was Sears before it became the Playhouse. Some of those rooms in that building, because I've done shows at the Playhouse, weren't even used. It was just a big monstrosity that they leased and now Cleveland Clinic owns. So we'll see what they did. I had a proposal that they do therapeutic theater there, but I didn't have a degree at the time, so nobody listened to me. I have a degree now, though. I have two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was getting ready to shift gears and talk about that because I did not miss the fact that you said you graduated from Cleveland State University and then yes. a year later you were moving to Florida, uh, you know, and you also shared that you have a brother that's 75 years old. So if you got a brother that old, you probably ain't in your 20s or 30s. Oh, no, no. No, no disrespect. I, I, I'm, I am proud to say that, uh, Lord, let me see November. I'll be 68. Okay. So and what I, I wanted to... I mean, I wear it well, so I'm okay. not mad about it. Okay, <laughs> but, so uh, what I wanted yeah, to get I, to... I graduated at age 60. I was the second eldest in my class. And I was upset because the lady that was honored as the eldest graduating um, grad, graduate from that class was only 60, 62. And I was 60. I'm like, well, why don't y'all mention both of us? And they actually did mention the both of us. They called us unique students. I went back to school after I sent my children to school. And it took me five years to get a four-year degree because in the midst of that, my mother died. And I took off for a semester and my brother was so in my face, Dr. Matthews, get back in school. Mommy will want you to go back to school, get back. And so I finally in two, 2015 uh, graduated. Uh, and I, my, my degree is in nonprofit administration because I had the kind of professor uh, uh, who was my counselor who said, why do you keep taking theater? You know theater. You could teach theater. You could write theater. Go to the other side and learn the nonprofit issues. And I'm so grateful for, I can't think of her name, doctor. Oh my God, I could kick myself. Um, I see her face, but I can't think of her name. But anyway, I'm glad she steered me in that direction because I know how to write proposals and grants now. I know the tax information about running a nonprofit. And I'm at the age, Vince, where I'm not going to throw that knowledge away. Had I been younger, I think I, I would have been like, eh, I'm a know-it-all and I know. But now I feel um, privileged in a way with all this knowledge and age combined and wisdom and experience where I know I can meet my goals. I'm, I'm finally at a point where I'm, I'm seeing them about to happen. I mean, it's like that, that saying, they say, don't give up right before the miracle. The miracle is at arm's reach. And I am happy I went in the direction I did and went back to school later because I tried school when I was 18. And I dropped out because I was into party and not school. But when I went back at age 55, the kids thought I was a professor. They'd always say, good morning, Professor Jackson. I'm like, I'm a student. Leave me alone. <laughs> you know? But I got it. At age 60, I got a degree. And I'm very, very proud of that. Yeah. Well, I, I really relate to that idea of getting a, a degree later in life because mm -hmm. the very same thing happened to my mother. Uh, she was an LPN for years. She had worked at various VA hospitals and places where uh, my father was stationed in the Air Force. And uh, she ended up in Chillicothe, where uh, she has her home right now. Mm -hmm. While she was there, she was in her 50s and she had an opportunity to get a degree and become a registered nurse. So nobody could be any prouder than I am of mom because she did exactly what she, what you did. And that was get a degree at an advanced stage in, in, in life. And it just goes to prove that it's never too late. You know, I, I was watching um, something online today and it indicated that Anthony Anderson 
has gone back to Howard University yes. to get his degree because he had to drop out before he studied. And he actually studied acting at Howard University. His son is also a student there. So it must be kind of a unique situation for a father and son to be attending the same university. Kudos to them for taking education seriously because it yes. can dramatically uh, transform your life. I'm going back. Okay. I want to go to, uh, I've always <laughs> wanted to go to um, a historical black university. Okay. And uh, FAMU is right here. And I think that might be why I'm itching to get back to Tallahassee. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to talk about that return to Tallahassee, but we're going to come back to Cleveland before we end this show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My <laughs> guest this morning is Renee Matthews Jackson, a multidisciplinary uh, artist now living in Bellevue, Florida, with the intention and intention to return <laughs> to Tallahassee, yes. where she created the Frenchtown Coalition for the Arts. And let's hope that that happens, too. We'll be back with more right after this. 95.9 FM, WOVU, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. Back in a minute. Hi, this is Ken Hawkins. Hi, this is Pinky. This is T.C. Lewis. This is Shantae Chavers. This is Reggie Heyman. This is Bill Silverby Richards. If you're not listening to WOVU 95.9 FM, you're not in the mix, 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 mix. I'm Silverby cranking up. 24 hours of golden. Cleveland, we know you have something to say. We know there are things on your mind you've been itching to get out. Call the WOVU Talkback Line, 216-200-7848, and tell us what it's all about. Tell us what's bothering you. Tell us what makes you happy. Tell us what you want to hear on WOVU. Call or text the WOVU Talkback Line, 216 216- 200 7848. This is WOVU, our voices united. We can't do what we do without you. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest this morning is Renee Matthews Jackson, multidisciplinary artist now living in Bellevue, Florida. Uh, before we went into this break, well, we talked about a number of things, but as we ended that segment, we were talking about her possible return to Tallahassee. So tell us, what's your motivation for that? What do you want to accomplish? I, I want to go to FAMU. Okay. Um, I want to, but the only thing is FAMU doesn't have um, a film major. And I, that's, that's the only part of what I do that I don't know. Uh, screenwriting and film. I mean, I know every other part of writing novels, short story, play, theater. I don't know screenplay writing. And so my um, nephew graduated with a master's in film from Full Sail. And he kept saying, oh, it's on in Orlando. And he just go, go online and then come here once or twice a week for labs and stuff. It's just an hour away, which makes perfect sense. But Full Sail, even though it is one of the best film schools in America, it's not a black college. So I believe I'll go back to them. I'll go to FAMU and study education because that's my alternative is to teach theater and to do a Margaret Ford Taylor thing and teach and direct and write. And um, and Margaret has written movies. So I could write a movie with a, a degree in education. Um, so I, I, I'm weighing it, but I really want to get back so that I can get Frenchtown Coalition started again. And I really want to attend FAMU. They have essential theater. And when I first got in town, Reggie Kelly, the dancer, singer, multi-talented actor, suggested that I go meet Dr. Matthews, the dean of theater. And I said, Matthews, that's my name, you know. And I met Dr. Matthews and she was so very kind to me. And since I've been in three online essential productions, essential theater productions during COVID, and they're still sending me invitations to come back and to be part of the theater. So I do have a wonderful connection with essential theater and it's 
the only black theater in that area. And uh, I was raised in black theater. And I'm not going to dispel theater Tallahassee, but they don't do our plays much. I was actually in, and then there were none by Agatha Christie. And the original title of that was 10 Little, the Mm N-word. And when she got to America, they made her change it. She changed it to 10 Little Indians. And the Native Americans didn't like that. And so they made her, she took the last line of the book and then there were none. And that has become the play. I was actually the first African-American ever to be cast in the history of that production. And Margaret Ford Taylor, my mentor says, why are you gonna do that? Why do you, I said, I don't know. It's just because I can. And, but that gave me leverage. I mean, in the city of Tallahassee because I was a newcomer on stage, on this big stage, First African-American to be in the production of, and then there was none. And I was the only one that got pressed. So I brought Caramel with me. You know, Caramel House teaches us to go for it and get it and take it. And that's what I did. (laughs) So I need to get back in that environment. Okay. So you've talked about acting. You've talked about writing plays. uh, You've talked about rapping. When was it that you realized that you were this artistic person and that you had to have an outlet for your creativity? When I was a kid, my dad used to, we had a fenced in like garden area with grass and my dad, and there was a clothesline and my dad used to hang up curtains for us and we'd have talent shows. And I was always Martha with Martha and the Vandellas. I was always Diana Ross. I was not, I had to be the lead. and. I would write plays for kids in our neighborhoods to do in my parents' backyard. So, and then here's a funny story. When I went to kindergarten, because my mother read nursery rhymes to us all the time, well, maybe just me, maybe she saw something in me. I thought you talked in rhyme. So in kindergarten, I would only talk. I was very shy, very timid. But when I did speak, it was in rhyme. And it frustrated my teacher. (laughs) So my teacher called my mother. And my mother said, I'm sorry, it's all my fault. I have been reading nursery rhymes to this child since she was in the womb. And so I think my parents developed this leadership quality in all of us. um, But they knew mine was artistic and, and they pushed it. So I've always had quite an imagination. And uh, what is it that Einstein said? Um, Imagination is everything. I've always thought way out of the box. And so I think it was just childhood. And I've always had a passion for the arts. And like I said, we were raised at Duck Pond. (laughs) No, I mean, we were there every Sunday. And that's one of the biggest arts institutes in the world. And of course, when we were kids, now you remember this, Vince, we always had field trips to Caramu, to the Cleveland Orchestra, to wherever. They don't do much of that anymore. So if you were going to be an artist, you could see it as a child because of what we were given in Cleveland. Cleveland is the arts mecca to me. It's the second largest theater district in the country. People think of Chicago, Pittsburgh, L.A., No, it is New York and then Cleveland. We have 14 regional theaters in Cleveland. I mean, New York only has like 22. So if you were going to be an artist, the place to come out of was Cleveland, Ohio. If you were going to be a leader, we had the first black mayor, the first black congresswoman. As a black person coming out of Cleveland, you could accomplish anything because of the leadership around us and the, the people that were paving the way for us. So childhood is my answer. Well, you know, <laughs> as you were describing your experience as a five-year-old, I was thinking that you were kind of like uh, a mini Dolomite <laughs> without the profanity. Or Dr. Seuss. Uh, and, and, but the other part of it was, it was like, well, you know, you had that creative aspect to yourself at that time and you could speak in rhyme so it should have been something that they encouraged and embraced rather than discouraged 
it would it frustrated the teacher because the only times I spoke, I spoke in rhyme. And my mother, you know, after a while, my mother's like, look, you're gonna have to stop that because I didn't do it at home. And maybe it was because I was shy and this was my comfort. I, I'm not sure. But my mother, even when I got older, she said, this child talked in rhyme in kindergarten. It's no wonder she's a poet. So my parents had a lot to do with our leadership abilities. Because even to politics, I can remember my mother sitting at a lunch counter at Woolworths downtown. And I thought the North wasn't prejudiced. My mother said, America's prejudiced. Renee, and she didn't use races as often as we use it, but she sure used prejudice a lot. My parents did. And so my, even my political activity, because I remember I used to rap at Vails for, um, for uh, Congressman Stokes and CJ Prentice and Fannie Lewis. They said, girl, write a rap. I wrote a rap about money because of CJ Prentice. And she gave me $150 to write that rap. She commissioned me to write a rap about money. So my influences have been my family first. And then these powerful people that they're gone. A lot of them are gone. But those were some powerful people we had when we were young then. Yeah. What was that lady's name, Robinson, that had a, a place on you that we used to go and do poetry? Uh, you're talking about at the Green Light Shopping Center? No, it was a house. It's a big old house. Uh, and her name was something Robinson, too. She was very close with uh, Eddie Backus's family. She may have been a, a relative of theirs. Okay. We used to go do poetry at, at her place. And just the, the cultural... Um, it was just so much culture and so much art. I didn't have a choice, really. That was the house that was across the street from from Doc Jordan's dental practice. Yes. Okay. What I was remember her name? PJ PJ yeah. Robinson. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I, People I, like that. Okay. I'm I'm kind of remembering that I might have been there once or twice, uh, but there were some other things that were going on at the time. Uh, but I want to get back to some of those folks that you just mentioned because before we started this interview. You mentioned a few folks who were actually mentors or folks that you looked up to. And you talked about Margaret Ford Taylor. So I want to give you an opportunity to talk about your relationship with her as well as those as well as those others. When we come back, okay. you're listening to Open Door on 95.9 FM WOVU. I'm Vince Robinson. My guest is Renee Matthews Jackson. We'll be right back. Are you or someone you know in need of help? Here's a resource you can turn to. The Thea Bowman Center has been serving the community for over 50 years and provides services to help support Mount Pleasant and surrounding communities of all ages. Some of these programs include adult education like GED, computer classes, food pantry, senior outreach, youth after school, and summer programs, and much more. Are you a Cleveland resident in need of a GED preparation, a food pantry, youth or senior programs? Then call the Thea Bowman Center at 216-491-0669 or visit theabowmancenter.org. Call the Thea Bowman Center at 216-491-0669 or visit theabowmancenter.org to register today. This message is brought to you by the Thea Bowman Center and WOVU 95.9 FM, Our Voices United, a Burton Bell Car community radio station. Hey, this is Crazy T. Hi, I'm Lindsay Sims, the CEO of Predictable Results Marketing. Hi, this is Stephanie Phelps. Hi, this is Wanda Harris. Hello, this is Hanford Top Dog Dixon. Hi, this is Honey Bell Bay, the Purple Poet. What a dooskies, lovely listeners. This is Kiko. What's up, guys? I'm Yoni Lopes. It's E-Rock Beats. It's Ray Uza. And we are Hot Nation. Nation. And you're listening to Burton Bell Car Community Radio. W-O-V-U 95. Point nine FM. This is 95.9 FM WOVU, a Burden Bell Car community radio station. Now back to Open Door with Vince Robinson. 
Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson and my guest, Renee Matthews Jackson. We were just talking about some of the fantastic women that she was associated with and some that she actually looked up to uh, as she grew up here in Cleveland, as she progressed through her uh, theatrical career and all the other things that she was doing in the artistic realm. Uh, You mentioned Margaret Ford Taylor, but you also mentioned Fannie Lewis. Talk to me about Fannie Lewis and what she meant to you. Um, I was SELC youth director from like 19... Uh, I don't know, my youngest son may have been like six. So 1989 until 1995 or something like that through the Wings of Hope program at Mount Sinai Baptist Church. And Fannie Lewis sat on the board of Wings of Hope. My brother was very smart as to who he asked to be board members. Charles Bevel, uh, Fannie Lewis, C.J. Prentice. Uh, Omar Ali Bay, Khalid Samad, all of us were on this panel, this group together. And we were trying to figure out how to impact the city economically. Uh, because, and then Fannie Lewis said, well, honey, we black folks, how long does uh, uh, the black dollar stay in our community? And I said, I don't know, 24 hours. She said, it stays in the community seven minutes. How long does the Jewish dollar stay in the community? And I really didn't know the answer to that. And I said seven, she said seven days, it never leaves. And she said, we have to get smart like this. So we began to work on this proposal called the economic fast, where the first three days of February, black folks didn't spend any money. But Fannie Lewis said, you gotta be smart about it. She says, not really gonna be a fast. What you do, is on July, I mean, January 29th, 30th, and 31st, you stockpile. You go and you buy everything you need. And the stock market is going to go up. It's going to look like, oh, we black folks are spending a lot of money. She said, then on the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of February, don't you spend a dime. And watch the impact. So I wrote um, a rap about it. Uh, and it simply says, C.J. Prentice is the one who inspired me to do that. But I said, um, watch how you spend your money today. When you feel the urge to spend, drink water and pray. Watch the impact this day will unfold. And remember, don't forget who is mining the gold. Black people stand together to stomp out poverty by investing in your own economy. And the rap is a lot longer than that. But Fanny. And CJ inspired me to write that rap and gave me so much firsthand knowledge about politics. Um, Fannie Lewis told us we had to get rid of the gatekeeper. And I said, well, who's the gatekeeper? And she looked at me and she said, you don't know. And I'm not going to say their name, but it was a mayor. (laughs) Mm -hmm. She got another man crazy. And she said, when I'm with a (laughs) gatekeeper. Fannie Lewis was fire. I have never seen that kind of outspoken fire come from a black woman before. And so I was just enthralled by her. And she sat down with me. She used to say, daughter, because we had meetings often with Wings of Hope. I mean, I really commend my brother for at that time bringing together these powerhouses. I felt like a peon in that room. But what I learned then, oh my gosh, I can't even share half of it with you, what I learned from a Fannie Lewis. I went out in the Huff neighborhood with her and walked those streets. She were, was making children pick up debris off the ground. Come over here, baby, pick that paper up. Keep your neighborhood beautiful. And they loved her. So that was one of my powerhouse um, influences was Fannie Lewis. I will give props to her all my life. Okay. You also mentioned uh, Margaret Ford Taylor, and I know because you were in theater, you would have had some encounters with her. Talk about your relationship with her. Margaret and I still have a wonderful relationship. I speak to Margaret maybe once or twice a month, and she appreciates that because she says, baby, I think people don't forgot about me. Don't nobody call me. But Margaret taught me what I know about theater and what I know about acting. Um, 
Margaret would have had me in a higher position at Caramu had I had a degree. And she's the one who encouraged me to go back to school. Um, Margaret Ford Taylor is just a powerhouse. She's been in theater 60 years and she doesn't get the accolades she deserves. Uh, Margaret has been in film. She's been in theater. She was in Denzel Washington's Anton Fisher. She is the one who got all the black actors together for that movie. And people don't give her the credit she deserves. Um, and right now, I talked to Margaret about two weeks ago. She's having a hard time now. She lost her son. Um, and it's been very difficult for her. But she still still sounds strong and vibrant. And so I do a lot of praying for her at this time because I can't imagine losing a child. And I can kind of tell the difference in her um, since she lost her son. Uh, but Margaret's been a mentor since the day I walked. The day I walked in Caramu to audition for a play, I had a briefcase, and I had I worked at Ernst and Ernst, so I had on this pinstripe suit. I had just gotten off work, like a lawyer. I looked like a lawyer, and Margaret looked me up and down. She said, "Who are you?" And I said, "You don't remember me when I was ten years old. You picked me to be in this play called The Christmas Cookie." She said, "Oh, I remember your face." And so she saw my audition. Margaret looked me up and down and said, you must think you're me. That is the best compliment I have had so far as an actor, because I know how powerful Margaret Ford Taylor is. And that is one of my only female mentors that's still alive. And so I keep very close touch with Margaret Ford Taylor, even to this day. Okay. And it reminds me, I'm going to call her tonight. <laughs> okay. Well, when when you call her, tell her that somebody's interested in giving her the opportunity to tell her story. I certainly will. And I will put her in touch with you, Vince. OK. All right. So who else has resonated with you? Are there any others that stand out? Uh, Ruby D. Uh, Ruby D wasn't from Cleveland, but she was always in Cleveland. And I believe that's why that huge mural is on the side of Caramel House because of how, how much she donated to that theater and how much she influenced that theater. As a um, actor, I remember she held a workshop during the 75th anniversary of Caramel House in the basement. And so I did this, we were all doing monologues and she critiqued them. So I did my monologue and she stopped me and she says, I want you to do it like the poet you are. Now, mind you, I had never met Ruby Dee. How in the world she knew I was a poet, I don't know. So when she left, you know, she lived in New Rochelle, New York. When she left, I had her number. And so I contacted her and I said, I'm writing this book of poetry. And that's one of my published books it's called Poet Unknown. I did that in Cleveland. I self-published. I made 100 copies at a, uh, the, uh, what was that festival over at Murtis Taylor they used to always hold? Well, I did that festival. I read some poems out of that book, and that book sold all but one copy, which my mother made me keep for her. And um, I asked Ruby D to write the foreword for that, and she said, "Honey, I don't critique poetry. I critique acting." Yeah, so I, I Ruby D, um, Stephanie Tub Jones, she used to come to our shows, and we used to go to Lancers uh, with her and the Stokes brothers, and and Grace Wade Jones and, and just the conversations. But like I said, most of my mentors are gone. I still do talk to Bill Cobb. He's not a, a woman, but I still talk to him every once in a while. He's a mentor. Um, but I feel like Vince, I've been very blessed, even to you, to the people I've met along my path, because you don't necessarily know what your destiny is, but mine, so far has been so good. Yes. Well, it's just a wonderful thing that you can express yourself in so many different ways. You know, we are, are identifying you as a multidisciplinary artist. And I relate to that as well because I write poetry. I write other kinds of things. I perform music. I do all the things that I do. And folks kind of struggle with that because when they describe you, they want to put a label on you and it's right. that one thing, you know, but we're multidimensional beings, which means that we have different abilities 
and we can excel in all of them. We don't have to be lackluster in one just because we do something else. So kudos to you for being able to pursue all those things and show excellence in all of them. And I would have to imagine also that some of those who have inspired you pushed you to do that. Yes, definitely. Um, Even to me dabbling now in visual art, I actually have sold like 12 paintings recently, which I was very surprised at because I'm so new at this. Um, And my kids all want the paintings in their house. Mommy, this is really good. And when my kids tell me something is good, then it's good because they're very critical. And um, I, I, I just, I don't know how to uh, separate one genre from another. Uh, to me, it's all art. And it, it's, I love poetry first because I've been a poet since I was a little girl. And I've always claimed poetry. People are like, I am not a poet. I just write a little. No, I am a poet and I know it. <laughs> and I, every day I show it. Um, because I write a poem a day. And the visual art came when Tony Blair, who was also a mentor for me, and my business partner for 22 years, we toured several different shows that we wrote for 22 years. And Connie developed cancer. And when she got cancer, she said, I don't want to talk about it. So I wouldn't bring it up. So what I did, I wouldn't bring it up unless she brought it up. And so what I did was I painted. I just took to painting out of nowhere. Now, I think I did a little bit dabbling in painting when my kids were young. So I can remember drawing the Disney characters for Ezo I bought my son. And I did pretty good. But I, my first painting was cancer burning up. Because I was so angry at cancer. And after that, I have 122 paintings since 2014. So I'm like my son, my you just a fanatic. When you get to starting something, you don't know how to stop. I think that's part of my problem too. Is that, um, and it's not a problem. I mean, don't don't get the word problem wrong. I, I got it wrong. It is that I have such a passion, and my parents taught us if a task has once begun. Never leave it till it's done. Be the labor great or small. Do it well or not at all. And I will carry that to my grave. That is absolutely amazing. You know, and something else that I find amazing is the idea of writing a poem every day. You know, yeah, I I belong to this group on Facebook, which a friend of mine I've known for 18 years from allpoetry.com. I was on a website, allpoetry.com. I was the moderator for old poetry because when I got there, they had two poets, Langston Hughes and Phyllis Wheatley. I'm like, oh, where is uh, uh, Margaret Walker? Where is uh, County Cullen? Where? And they said, we've never heard of these people. So my job was to add the Black poets and writers to oldpoetry.com. So I stayed there 12 years and then we kind of fizzled out of, of, I don't know what happened. They got a little restrictive with like, I, I wrote a poem about lynching and I put a background to it uh, with Billie Holiday. And then I put up a lynch, a lynching and they took that down. They said it was uh, derogatory and demeaning to some people's view. And I said, well, how do you think I feel? So I finally just kind of slid out of there. Wow. Amazing. You know, uh, Renee, this this hour has just flown by. Yes, it has. But in the course of this hour, we've learned so much about you. And now, you know, you've gotten all these things under your belt and you've added visual artists to it. One hundred and ninety eight paintings. Yes, that's phenomenal. Uh, yeah, I, I think that there might be a little bit of that in me. I just haven't pursued it yet. Uh-huh. Well, one of these days, I'm going to pick up a paintbrush and some acrylic paint and whatever it looks like is what it will look like. And I'm sure it will. And it will call good. it abstract. We'll yeah. Just well, call it abstract. <laughs> what, whatever it is, it will be art to me. And as long as I'm happy with it, that that's all that matters. 
Uh, I want to thank you for joining me this morning on Open Door and uh, welcome you back anytime you get something new you want the world to know about. Let me know and I'll I'll help spread the word. But until okay. then, know yourself, love yourself, be yourself and make today your best day. Peace. Thank you, Vince.